Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We have a great show for you tonight. Dale Klapmeyer is here, co-founder of Cirrus Aircraft. And before we get started with the rest of the show, a few notes, of course, as we always do. First of all, Tonight's broadcast will be recorded, and so that will be available on Social Flight's YouTube channel. Just search for Social Flight on YouTube, one word, Social Flight, and you'll be able to find us there. In addition to that, you can type in questions, and while we will not be uh, going direct question to question in tonight's program, I will certainly be keeping an eye on the questions as they come in and try to fit them into our discussion as Dale and I uh, talk about everything about his life and also about Cirrus. Um, so uh, be sure to do that. In addition, um, whether you're viewing tonight's broadcast on a mobile device or on the web, there are some controls that you can use to make sure that you can change the size of the screen for times that we are showing anything, a picture or anything like that, and um, change the size so that you can see that larger. And also on a mobile device, sometimes you can swipe left or right if you want to change what you're viewing. So the controls for what you're seeing are usually on your device here directly. So uh, with that also, let's get started. I'm going to go and uh, open up my screen right now and uh, show you. I'll tell you, one of the things that we have done, we started Social Flight Live in the very beginning, dedicated to supporting general aviation. Social Flight itself has tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations. Our whole goal is to keep people flying and support the industry. And when the pandemic hit, one of the most important things that we did for ourselves, that we wanted to take it upon ourselves, is to support the industry, to support all of you out there, but also to make sure that FBOs are taken care of, that uh, all the companies that produce products and aircraft for our industry, uh, we do everything we can to support them. And that certainly means that we encourage people to keep flying. And as we are now going into the darker winter months, and that there is unfortunately uh, bad or negative news continuing to come out about where the crisis currently is, we want to reaffirm that and do everything possible to encourage people to get out there and when you're, as long as you're practicing safe social distancing, get out there and fly. And so we do that by example, and we like to share some of our stories with you. And this past weekend, uh, myself, uh, Jake, and his girlfriend, Jenna, took a flight that we documented out where we were able to go up and fly over Boston and uh, head out and go over to Provincetown. And so we got some amazing pictures that you can see here just to show you a little bit and encourage you to get out there and fly for your proficiency and also just support, just support your, your mental health and, and help others. And uh, it is amazing. We were able to fly right over Logan Airport, not something that's, uh, that's easily done during normal times. Of course, not a lot of traffic there, but it was amazing to see how close that we were able to go during that. Um, you really get to see some amazing things. And in a very short period of time, I think we made the decision to take this trip at about noon, um, that uh, we were probably on the beach at Provincetown uh, by maybe 1.30 and home by 3.00. And it was, it's really something special that general aviation has the ability of doing and uh, that it's important for us to practice, to practice our, our abilities, our rights, and keep our proficiency going. And so I just wanted to send that message of encouragement to show, uh, uh, help encourage you, take others that are within your, uh, your social circle um, out flying, keep that going, keep your proficiency going. And if there's anything that you are considering doing uh, to purchase for your plane, to uh, enhance it or anything like that, well, um, be sure to do that as well. It's a great time, I'm sure Dale would say also, to, to buy an airplane. And um, so um, with that, the last point I'd like to do is we are in the last days of our Fly to Win Challenge here with Social Flight. And uh, that means that on December 1st, we're giving away a Lightspeed Zulu 3 headset. We are always giving something away here at Social Flight. And all you need to do is get the free mobile app for Apple or Android devices, uh, register for your account. It's all free. Go fly somewhere, check in, and that's it. You're in there uh, and you have a chance to win the headset. I think over the last few years, we've been giving away just, I think last year might have been $50,000 or something of prizes. It's just 
fantastic stuff and I really encourage you to participate because there's a great chance of winning. Now with that, I'd like to go and move on uh, to our guest tonight. I am so excited to have uh, Dale Klapmeyer here, uh, co-founder of Cirrus Aircraft. And um, when we bring him on, I just want to show something here. Every, if, if every year that I went to uh, Sun and Fun with my boys, Jake and Ben, one of the things that, that always caught our eye as we were walking through there was this, the Cirrus VK30. And you know, this goes back to the very beginning and one of the things that we're going to talk about. And I just wanted to share that that the connection that actually we kind of have with that. And 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 it just made such a difference to see this every time it was like an icon when you go to the show. So, you know, Dale Klapmeyer and his brother Alan may arguably have had the most significant impact on general aviation since the iconic names that built our original fleet of aircraft. And those are names like Clyde Cessna, William Piper, Walter Beach. Together, they created one of the few new aircraft designs in modern times. And I'm going to uh, uh, bring that to bring him in uh, right now. And these, this design incorporated and most importantly, certified innovative new technologies that hadn't really been done before with composite construction, the CAPS aircraft parachute system, and most recently, the Cirrus Vision Jet. Their innovations and success in execution have earned both Dale and his brother Alan honors from every corner of aviation, including the National Aviation Hall of Fame. I am absolutely uh, thrilled to um, have uh, Dale here and um, send the message right now. We'll see if we can get him on uh, on the line and uh, here as our guest on Social Flight Live. How are you doing, Dale? All right. I, I got the right buttons. I'm on. You did. <laughs> you did. Thank you yeah. so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you. This is this is fun. I'm glad to be a part of it. So, Dale, I showed that picture because I wanted to kick off with this thing that goes way back, obviously, in, in your background, the, the VK-30, which for some reason I can't say just, just pulled at our heartstrings and was this iconic thing to walk past as an entry point to Sun and Fun every single year. Tell me a little bit about your background and how, how this all got started. So uh, <clears throat> aviation started for me uh, and actually my brother as well, at a very young age. My uncle was a, a pilot. Uh, my dad took flying lessons when he was younger, but actually didn't quite take with him at that time. And my grandfather was probably one of the very early uh, uh, business people in aviation. He had, in the very early 30s, I think it might have even been a Piper J2, but in the early 30s, he was flying around in a a little piper with a pilot. He sold pasteurizing equipment and he would fly to dairies and land in the hayfield next to the dairy and go in and sell his equipment. So flying business entrepreneurs has always been a part of our family. Uh, Alan, uh, who's three years older than I am, really was pushing the aviation bug through our family. So uh, my parents decided they wouldn't let us become pilots until they did. So both my parents got their pilot's license, then let Alan get his pilot's license. And as soon as I was old enough, I got mine. Alan was already a pilot. So, and in college, when I was ready to start learning to fly. So he and I and my oldest brother, Ernie, all went and bought a 1947 Cessna 140. <laughs> and and wow. we kept that in a hayfield north of town a little private uh, uh, strip. So I, I had an airplane before I had a car. And <laughs> I the goal that. was to say I could fly alone before I could drive alone, although I, I didn't hit that. I did solo after I was, was already driving. But so from a very early age, I mean, aviation was a big part of our lives. As it was actually just before graduating from from high school, I was on a camping trip with another friend in northern Wisconsin. And at that time, every place we'd go, we'd stop at the airports and see if there are any cool airplanes there. So this would have been uh, <clears throat> spring of 79. We stop in 
Clintonville, Wisconsin on our way home from camping. And there's a champ sitting there upside down, still in the tie down spot, but it's sitting upside down. And apparently it had been flipped in the storm. And I went into the FBO and asked who owned the airplane and, you know, where they be willing to sell it. And I'm looking at this as a cool project. Person who owned it lived about a mile down the airport, a mile from the airport down the road. Uh, we went right over there, knocked on the door. A, a woman came to the door and said, you know, I'm curious about your airplane. And I mean, she was, she made a deal right there on the spot. She <laughs> wanted it gone. Yeah. Oh, so if she was well, the pilot. It, it is upside husband, down after all. <laughs> yep. But she wanted no part of it. So yes, we were interested. She sold us the airplane. I went went home, uh, called up Alan and said, you know, Alan, we're we're buying a, a wrecked airplane. We put together every penny that we had, and that was fourteen hundred dollars. Sent it to this couple in uh, in Wisconsin. At that time, uh, we're living down in DeKalb, Illinois. So sent it up to Wisconsin. At the meantime, we're Alan and I are trying to figure out how we're going to tell our parents that we just bought a wrecked airplane. <laughs> and we walk into the house one day and my parents are, are both home and they're sitting there and it was one of these deals, you know, we've all experienced it. Boys, come here, sit down. We look at each other like, what'd you do? I don't know, what'd you do? I don't know. <laughs> we didn't know, but we knew we were in trouble. <laughs> we sat down and they said, we understand you just sent all your money to somebody in Wisconsin. The banker called my parents before we ever got up the nerve to tell them. So then, yes, we had to say, well, we bought a wrecked airplane and we're going to rebuild it and <clears throat> we're going to sell it and make all this money rebuilding it and selling it. And can we borrow the car and trailer? Because we have to go get it. <clears throat> so that was our uh, first real foray into aviation. We bought that airplane thinking that it was going to be a summer job. A summer uh, to rebuild it uh, between the time I'm in high school and my first year in college and then sell it before that starting college and we'd have some money then and it didn't take three months it took two and a half years to rebuild it <laughs> we actually didn't have any money so we were fixing things on it that we should have been replacing uh, but you know, we did make it fly. There's one side story to all of this. You know, as I said, my uncle was a pilot. He lives up here in Minnesota, in uh, Mora, Minnesota. And that summer of 79, he bought a new hangar for his airplane. So when we were up there, it was like, you know, you got to come see my new hangar. We went over to the airport, saw his new hangar, walked into his hangar, and we look up, and there's four wings hanging in the, the rafters. And I said, well, what are those? And he goes, I don't know. They were here when I bought the hangar. I have no idea what they are. So we pull them down and we're looking at them. They look an awful lot like champ wings. Huh. So sure enough, there are four perfect condition. Well, I shouldn't say perfect condition. I mean, they, they needed to be rebuilt, but all the ribs were in great shape. There was no damage. Leading edge was perfect on them. So we thought this is, you know, we're in heaven. We're going to take these wings apart and have a easy way to have a really good set of wings for our, our champ. So we took those down, loaded them on a trailer, brought them down to uh, our farm in Southern Wisconsin where we were re rebuilding the airplane. And we weren't ready for the wings. So we hung them in one of the sheds out back behind the barn thinking, you know, in a few months we'll be ready to start in on the wings. Well, it wasn't a few months. It was actually a year before we needed to get to the wings. We went out there literally a year later, walked into the shed to go get our beautiful wings because now we're going to rebuild the wings. The cows had gotten out, gotten into the shed, and proceeded to destroy all four wings, flatten them, just wrecked every <laughs> single bit of them. So then we're back in there ribs instead of replacing ribs and but it was it was that experience that really made me say that I wanted to be in aviation I think Alan was dreaming of that long before for me I wanted to fly but 
rebuilding that airplane. I was like, I'm going to be in aviation. I'm going to build airplanes. I want to do this. I, I was catching on to Alan's dream. He wanted to design, build airplanes. Now, that after that, it was like, okay, I'm, I'm with you. I get it. I want to do the same thing. So we rebuilt that airplane and flew it. And uh, it was a flying wreck, no longer a wrecked airplane. <laughs> but it wasn't really an airplane that we could see ourselves selling very easily. So we ended up with a 140 and a Champ to fly around. There were two things that were always in the Champ on every flight. One was a roll of duct tape because something might fall off and need to be taped back on. <laughs> and there was always a pack of matches in there. Because we said, if we ever do actually wreck this airplane, we're going to burn it on the spot because we don't want anybody to see what we've been flying around with. So <laughs> that was our start in aviation. And of course, from, you know, in high school uh, on going to Oshkosh, you know, this would have been my 42nd year in a row at Oshkosh had it uh, actually gone on this year. So uh, the, uh, the enthusiasm, the ingenuity, the, you know, the, the Oshkosh, the EAA spirit of you can build, you know, whatever your heart can dream up uh, was so inspiring for us as kids and has been such a big part of our lives ever since. You know, you know, I have, I have to tell you, you you still seem way too young to be having a story of your life that starts out in a cow pasture, <laughs> and and fly and flying from fields and barns. That like that worked <laughs> before. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that we we had a bar, a farm, which was a vacation place, a weekend place, and on the farm was a barn and some sheds. So we rebuilt the the champ in. Uh, in one of these sheds and, and another story with this, we took over a shed, which was my dad's garage when we would go up there on the weekend and he didn't like that. So he built a nice, beautiful garage attached to the old farmhouse. And we had to promise never to put any airplane parts in his new garage. <laughs> well, of course that's fine until they go on vacation for a couple of weeks, right when we need to recover the airplane. We're putting <clears throat> new clean beautiful to in. and they're gone for a couple of weeks so we thought it's plenty of time cover the airplane in the garage and get it out before they ever get home they'll never know well it took us longer than two weeks to get everything covered on the airplane sure enough they came home airplane parts fill the garage so they can't get into the garage they didn't like that so they kicked us out of the garage and sent us to the barn and we kicked the cows out of the barn. We poured a new floor in the basement to fill up all the troughs and everything. And then basically said, the barn is yours. You can do whatever you want in the barn. No more airplane parts in the house. <laughs> so the barn is where Cirrus started in the basement of a barn. Wow. And so, so tell me how you how you moved from that point to deciding you're going to start creating and and even get a, gaining the knowledge to to create your own designs. I uh, um, we're talking about building airplanes and what it takes to build airplanes and sell airplanes and uh, this is now the early '80s. So we've just gone through the late 70s where the industry is going great guns you hit 80 81 and every year the general aviation industry is about half of what it was the year before and this is the time that we are talking about wanting to design and build airplanes it's not a very rosy industry to be thinking you want to get into it but the flip side of that is at that same time the kit industry was exploding EAA was just going great guns. So we're looking at these new designs saying, well, they're selling well because they are new, unique. Uh, so many of them are such high quality, great performing airplanes and relatively inexpensive. So through that, you know, in the, that early 80s, it was like, well, we can go do a kit plane. We can 
we can create that. So we decided that we needed to learn more about it. We should buy a kit. <clears throat> so it was uh, 1981. We went to Oshkosh with $200 in our pocket to go. Literally, we were going there to put a deposit on an RV4. And had we bought the RV4, we'd probably be flying around in metal airplanes today. <laughs> but at that time, Tom Hamilton introduced the glass air, the first glass air uh, yeah. tail. And we saw that and just fell in love with that airplane. So our $200 went to Stoddard Hamilton instead of uh, uh, RVs. <laughs> instead of Dick, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, bought, we bought the glass air. So now, you know, what are parents for? Parents are the bank, right? We went home and sat down with our folks and said, you know, again, we're a couple of college kids. We got no money. We need to borrow. At that time, the kit was $7,000. We need to borrow $7,000 from our parents. And that was not an easy conversation. You know, it's one, or what are you going to do with your life? You know, you got to go make something of yourselves. And, and in the conversation, at some point, my dad made a comment like, what do you think we are, the bank? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> isn't that what parents are? <laughs> So they, they said, okay, if, if we're the bank, we're going to treat you like a bank would. You have to do a business plan, and you have to convince us why us lending you $7,000 would be good for your education and your development and well-being for your future. The whole time thinking, well, we'd never do it, therefore that'll get them off the hook. And, of course, we did. We wrote a business plan. It was about 30 pages on why they should lend us $7,000 to go build a kit plane. Uh, they actually say they were so impressed that we did it, that we wrote the business plan for them, that they gave us the $7,000. I, have, I have to ask, do you still have a business plan that got you $7,000 back then? Uh, my parents say they still have it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I haven't read it since we gave it to them, but yes, they say they still have that uh, that original business plan someplace. Uh, we went out and uh, picked up the kit. I think it was a year later, it was a year backlog or something like that, and got to know the guys at Stoddard Hamilton, uh, became friends with them, learned from them, uh, but literally building the kit uh, we learned so much about building airplanes, and they were so helpful, and the industry was so helpful. But at the same time, we're dealing with them going, you know, this is a great airplane, and we can do this. And they don't seem any smarter than we are, and they actually put together a company to do this. So can we. So we built the, the glass air and got that flying. And, uh, and then as soon as I graduated from college, I graduated in December of 83. We started the company in January of 84 to go build our own design, which is the VK30 that you see there. So when you get into building an airplane like that, it was built very much like uh, the glass air was. It, yeah, you know, the same building technique. So we, uh, we probably bugged, Tom Hamilton and Ted Setzer and that crew a lot over the years while we were working on our airplane. But even beyond them, when you ask somebody in this industry for help and how to do something and for ideas, people lined up to help us. Yeah. So we, we uh, went off to build the airplane that we wanted at the time. We wanted a big, high-performing, very comfortable, uh, safe, easy to fly, uh, unique airplane. Mm. We got most of those in the, the VK-30. I wouldn't call it easy to fly. You know, we're, we wanted it as a pusher for aerodynamics. Uh, we were also looking at it as everything you load in the cabin moves the CG forward. So the CG point is actually when you're alone in the airplane. 
not when you have it full of people where most airplanes it moves back. So those are the things we we're looking for when we created our design. <clears throat> As it turned out, you know, it was uh, a couple of kids. You know, so when we started the company, I'm 23 years old. Alan's the old man at 26. At 23 or 26 years old, uh, complexity is a challenge. Something hard to do, that's, that's cool. If it's hard to fly, that, you know, that, that just adds to the romance of the whole thing. So right. when we were building the airplane, making it really complex wasn't a detriment. That was fun. You know, making something in the end it was hard to fly like yeah that's you know there's lots of systems and things that you're always monitoring and doing ah, that's that's all cool that that's the neat part you know it's so uh, we learned quickly after that that's maybe not what we wanted in aviation but it was the experience of building that airplane the, the trial the error the you know just working through each problem building a company around that. And although the airplane, we were not a successful kit company, which means we barely got enough money out to feed ourselves. I mean, it, you know, each okay, the year would be a problem. It would be next year, you know, just kind of putting along. So all weren't successful as a company in any terms that somebody would success. The airplane was so unique, so special, stood out. It was such an achievement that we became incredibly successful because of the fact of what that airplane was. Now, had the kit been a very successful kit plane, we probably wouldn't have moved on and done mm. the SR series. But we learned enough from it, and it created uh, a rec it was such a recognizable airplane that mm. people knew who Cirrus was. Right. Although, you know, not because it was pumping out a lot of airplanes, but because it was so unique. So it was an interesting combination. The fact that that airplane was so unique. Uh, made it so we weren't going to make it as a kit company, but because it was so unique, it set us up perfect to actually take the next step beyond, and that was moving into the the SR. So tell me about that transition then. Uh, so how did you make that transition to the to the SR and 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 even even what does the name of Skeev even mean? Um. So so the. The transition really was, we were sitting around saying, we're not going to make it as a kid company. It's time to either throw in the towel, go and get real jobs, because actually I don't know that I've ever had a real job. I've <laughs> just been playing my whole life. You know, it's either throw in the towel, go get a job, or we got to change what we're doing, because what we are doing right now isn't working. So, you know, let's go certify an airplane. So when you think of this, this is 1990 when we really are sitting around going, I'm not sure we're gonna make it much longer. What's our next options? 1991, the industry is at the absolute bottom. You know, we went from 18,000 general aviation airplanes in 79 to 88 and 89 was less than a thousand airplanes. 1990 was about a thousand airplanes a year. So, that's not a time that you say, gee, this is a help. What we need is another certified airplane. Right. But we looked at it and said, you know, if there's 18,000 airplanes sold a decade before and they're not being sold today, not because there's, not, there's a desire or not a desire for aviation. People still want to fly. Flying still makes sense. There's a problem with we don't want that airplane that's available today any longer. So the, the timing all of this was absolutely perfect for us to get started in it because we had a, we had a unique product that had a following. 
the industry was down, but it was still an industry that was, uh, it, you know, it wasn't buggy whips when the car came along. It was an in- industry that still has promise and mm. need. You know, there were other issues that brought down, and I don't, I don't want to say the industry actually, but our segment of the industry. When you look back in the 60s and 70s, in the 60s, they really started the the manufacturers, the big three, started to focus not just on single engine, small, just in airplanes. I mean, they were moving upscale at a very rapid rate. You know, the Citations and the King Line and the Cheyenne Line, the companies actually were successful, but they had left behind the development in the small airplanes. All of their development dollars were in something else mm-hmm. that left an opportunity for us as we saw it. You know, that wasn't a detriment, that was an opportunity. <clears throat> so, uh, a couple of kids with a uh, little company, maybe 10, 12 of us trying to kick out kit planes, now have to go figure out how to. Uh, Build, develop, develop, build, certify a new airplane that can be successful. And oh, by the way, we had no money. <laughs> you know, so <clears throat> there were a few challenges ahead. So we we looked at what our options were moving moving forward. Um, we could redo a kit plane and make a simple kit plane. We could make an airplane for the general aviation market, which uh, ended up being the current kit plane and drive that to a new development point as a single product, which was is actually what a jet would be. But this is 1990, 91 when we're conceiving that airplane. But it was the same performance, five seat, uh, very similar in market penetration to where the vision jet actually ended up. So at that time, we're <clears throat> we're still going to air shows. We're still trying to market the VK30. You know, and you'd get people coming up as as you can imagine, saying, "Oh, it's a cool airplane. I love it. You know, it's neat. How much? You know, well, the kit's fifty thousand dollars. You know." Kit, what are you talking about? Yeah, you got to build it. I don't want to build it. I want to buy it. You know, nobody wants to build an airplane like this. You know, what are you nuts? That type of thing. So we started to say, you know, well, yeah, if you want us to build it, you know, then we got to certify, and then it's good. It's a few million dollars, and most people, you know, scuff away. Ah, whatever. We had one guy who said, yeah, it's going to be, uh, you know, a few million bucks. He goes, oh, is that all? Okay, well, let's do that. And kind of look at each other. Okay, you want us to go certify there? Yeah, let's go certify this. And started working with him on what the ST50 could be. And at the same time, trying to figure out what it would actually cost to certify and develop an airplane. And our couple of million dollars is going to, eh, you know, it'll be more like 10 million. And go, oh, okay. Well, then we got to go get 10 million. And they keep working on it. Eh, it's probably going to be more like 20 million. Okay. We get 20 million. This was for about a year, and did where we said, "Well, it's going to be more like 40 million dollars to go certify this." And he said, "Okay, let's do it." So he put together a financing package uh, to go raise 40 million dollars, and actually, it worked out to be 45. Million. Wow! He had 50 million dollars of investment. Uh, the guy was a Swiss Israeli person, so he went to the Israeli government and sold them on an economic development idea to build these airplanes in Israel, and Israel would fund the program to the tune of two dollars for everyone invested. A uh, few interesting aspects of this, you know, that <clears throat> we spent a good year doing a business plan and convincing the, the Israeli government on how this program would work and got it all approved. 
but then each dollar that we spent was going to get replaced at two thirds. The problem is that you spend a dollar and then it takes months to get two thirds back, the 66 cents back, because you have to go back and reaffirm every single thing. So it takes months. So it was so far behind in funding. Mm. We went for 15 million of private equity money instantly. And then it was months. So the project was start, stop, start, stop. The other aspect of it is the reason that this seemed important or a good idea for the Israelis is it's jobs. It's all export business because there aren't going to be a whole lot of 300 knot turboprops flying back and forth across Israel. So it, yeah, so it's, uh, it's export, which is good for them. You know, it's relatively high tech, which is, is good. It's employment. But in Israel, where do you think they want to create employment? Now, at this time, it's 92, 93 time frame. Where they want to have the employment is a town called Kiryat Shimona, which is in the very northern part of Israel. Spectacularly beautiful area where two sides are Lebanon. Oh, and by the way, at the time they're at war with Lebanon. <laughs> Lebanon border is three miles away. The other side is the Golan Heights, and oh, yeah, there's still conflicts with uh, Syria over who actually controls the Golan. So the first thing that would go into this plant is a bomb shelter. And you like, <laughs> we're going to be building airplanes three miles away from where they're shooting at each other? Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> but sure enough, they built a plant there, and it's still there. And uh, the airplane was not successful, mainly because it was so badly under because of the timing. Mm. You, know, you just couldn't get momentum to get it going. So while we were working on that, the ST-50, we ended up selling the design and the rights to the airplane and for that sale we got the contract to build the prototype and then we were going to be involved with selling and marketing the airplane so we built the first airplane here in in duluth and uh flew it for i guess six eight months here and then took it apart shipped it to israel where they uh, continued the flight test on it and kept working on the design but that was about 98 99 it just <clears throat> it was out of money and ended up uh folding which is really a shame would have been a great great airplane so that was the st50 <clears throat> so at the same time uh, we kind of you know sold our first child to, mm. to uh create our own family so at that same time we're we know we can't build another airplane certainly like that, could never afford to do it. We had to come up with something simple, more straightforward, actually more of what we wanted. So at that time, when we started on the, the SR series, uh, I had two very young children, you know, a four-year-old and a one-year-old. And what I wanted was now very simple, very intuitive, very comfortable, uh, I wanted to be fast. Airplanes, we fly because we want to get from point A to point B quickly. But we didn't need to make it unique to be fast. Right. And our goal was we wanted to have an airplane that was pretty uh, conservative. We wanted somebody to walk up to our airplane and say, wow, that's a really nice looking airplane. I like it. But not be polarizing. And then have somebody, you know, I, I like your airplane. You turn around, you go back to your old, old airplane, your Cherokee or something, and go, you know, my, my warrior. You know, yesterday, that was a beautiful airplane. Today, it's old. <laughs> right. The auto industry is brilliant at that. You know, you buy the, the new car, and you love your car. Three years later, you walk into the dealership, and they got the new model there. Still four wheels, four doors, you know, the same car, but it's, enough different enough style that you walk back out and you're like man i got an old car now you know that type of that type of uh response is what we were after 
and being very comfortable and very intuitive was the most important thing. So this is where my wife comes in to, uh, to all of this. I met her in college. Uh, first time she had ever been in any airplane was in the champ and took her flying in the champ. Uh, and it's, it's amazing when you're dating, she'll fly on stuff. We, she'd work on the glass air while we were dating. We took <laughs> our glass air on our honeymoon for two weeks flying around the West. <clears throat> but after that, um, you know, and certainly when the kids come along and, and we have to now travel by then, we're living up here in, in Duluth, Minnesota, and we're going to go down to see her family or my parents, you know, that's a five hour drive. And it was, you know, we can, we can take one of the airplanes we have and we'll be there in an hour and 15 minutes. No, I'd rather drive. Hmm. So when you start to put that into perspective, why did she want to drive? Not because she wanted to spend an extra four hours on the road. She felt comfortable, relaxed, you know, understood everything in the airplane. She's in the airplane in, as I can say, the airplanes that we owned before we had our SRs. You know, most of them were uh, maybe not the most comfortable airplanes in the world. You know, they, they did leak air when it's in the winter, they're cold in the winter and the summer they're warm, you know, that, mm -hmm. that type of thing. And, and it was through this that you really realize, you know, we could make our airplane a few knots faster, but what is that worth? You know, would you, would you fly down there if it was only an hour and 10 minutes instead of five hours? No, five minutes, saving five minutes time isn't the issue. We're talking an hour and 15 minutes to five hours. Right. Speed is not the issue. Comfort, mm. being relaxed, understanding what's going on, all of those things. Why does somebody want to drive instead of fly? That's what we're after. Let's change. Let's take break all those down. If we can break those down, then you, know, then you can change this industry. Then it's no longer... Well, gee, my airplane's two knots faster than yours. Really? Who cares? You know, right. That stuff doesn't matter. What matters is when you are in the airplane, do you like being in that environment? Is mm -hmm. it does everybody know what's going on inside the airplane? So some of these stories coming back to uh, to my wife, you know, I, I get it, you know, didn't want to fly in the champ any longer, the 140. You know, the glass air was pretty small, you know, although very, very fast, uh, fun to fly. We had a biplane for a while, had a 182 RG, you know, then you're starting to get to where, okay, this is acceptable, but probably still rather drive. Had a 310 for a while. There's a big, comfortable, fast, six-seat airplane. Can do everything, two engines, you can't get any safer, right, all of this. And, and she's going, oh, I think I'd rather drive. You'd rather drive than go in a 310? Why? <laughs> I'm not that comfortable. Okay, why are you not comfortable? She goes, well, I'm not sure that, you're, that you know how to fly it right. I'm like, what? Me? I'm a great pilot. What are you talking about? I'm not sure I know how to fly it. Yeah, well, when we're, whenever we're in the 310, and I'll step back, you know, we had a, a 310Q, and it had a full panel. It was cool. But everything was duplicated on the right that I had on board. When we're flying in the airplane, she goes, I don't think you know how to fly it. When we're flying it, I only paid attention to my instruments and my engine. I never paid attention to her instruments and her engine. And therefore, I wasn't flying the airplane right. Mm. And it started to come out. It's like, well, all that's duplicated. Well, if it's just their duplicate, why is it there? That's, you're right. Why is it there? You know, so as we were conceiving the SR, it's like, we're going to shape the panel. We're going to make it a little bit more automotive-like. We're mm. going to make sure that the person in the right seat can fly, but it doesn't appear that they need to be a part of the crew. 
That's a, you know, that's a fascinating point because I have had it said to me before also, but, that, but I never actually connected it until you made this point just now. Because I, people have said, like, I have all this information in front of me, but I don't know what to do with it. I have this thing, in front, and, and there's a stress, I think, that yeah. comes with that to, to a passenger <laughs> that I think as pilots, we may never even consider. And if we do consider it, we've got this fantasy in our head that it's somehow the opposite. That somehow by by having a yoke and rudder pedals and maybe some instruments that we're providing more comfort to our passenger because yeah. they could somehow have Walter Mitty ideas of landing the aircraft. And in reality, they're thinking like, why do I have this? Exactly. It's just in the, the way. So she would sit there, you know, afraid to touch anything and afraid to move. It might touch the yoke and, you know, all of the stuff in front. And that was so apparent in something like the 3M, 310, although we were proud of the fact that this was a great panel in that. Huh. A great panel for a pilot is not a great panel for a passenger. Right. And what I learned very, very specifically on May 11th, 1985, when I married my wife, what I think doesn't necessarily matter. <laughs> it's what she thinks that that matters and that uh, and that's that's true but when you all of us have somebody to answer to you know spouse parents kids board of directors customers or clients you know we're always we are answering to somebody and if everybody that you answer to is saying you shouldn't be involved in aviation or you shouldn't do it or this is a bad idea you got an uphill climb mm -hmm. so he said let's take all those other things away Let's make sure everybody else is saying, I want to be a part of it. So when we were designing and developing the SR, you start with a top goal. The most important thing, one thing that never gets compromised. My wife, and this goes for Alan too, our wives. Our wives have to want to fly more than drive. That's mm -hmm. the goal. I don't want it to be, well, gee, you know, driving's okay. You know, it has to be, oh, if we can't drive, we're not going. I mean, if we can't fly and we have to drive, we're not going. Mm. And we got to that with the SR. And, and in reality, we didn't get there with the SR until we finally had PFD, you know, the full integrated cockpit. But the first MFD that was in there, I mean, we had big ideas on what we would be able to do with that. But it started with answering the three questions that every one of us as pilots used to get asked every single time we flew. First question was, where are we? Because for a non-pilot, you're looking out at a very strange uh, visualization of the landmarks, so they're lost. There's no way that a non-pilot understands triangulating between three radio points to, <laughs> to figure out where you are. Yeah, you know, so there, the non-pilot's assumption is, oh, okay, we're probably lost. That was certainly my wife's assumption. We must be lost. So she was always concerned that we're lost. Next question was, well, when are we going to get there? Because she's miserable. How long do we have to put up with this? And then the third question and actually, we'd go through the progression. Where are we? Because I must be lost. How long is it going to take to be there? Because I'm miserable. Consequently, she stares at the fuel gauge for the entire length of the flight. Because we're lost, we're going to fly around it either until we accidentally stumble across an airplane, airport, because my husband's not smart enough to navigate. <laughs> we're going to accidentally find an airport or we're going to run out of gas. So she'd stare at the gas gauge. So the first MFD had to change that. A line with your destination, an airplane on the line, a timer that says when you get to that destination and how much fuel you'll have when you get there. That right there takes the anxiety out of the most important questions that every single passenger asks. So right there, it's like, yeah. okay, now, now I'm starting to understand. I don't know anything about flying, but we're not lost. I know when we're going to get there. Yep, we got plenty of fuel. That is such a enormous game changer for the non-pilot and then ultimately you know when we put in the the uh, uh, flat panel p 
PFD. You know, and my wife could, for that first time, she didn't get afraid when we'd fly into the clouds. Mm. Because now she could look at a screen, okay, we're not lost. Can look over at another screen and see blue up and green down. Okay, that's kind of the way it should look like outside, so we're not out of control. Yeah. You know? And it takes the anxiety out of traveling in an airplane. You know, if we can't get there by air now, we don't go. It's wow. That's- now, the one thing that I didn't hear yet that I was expecting as part of that is is the chute. The parachute. <clears throat> you know, that's kind of our signature signature piece. And uh, uh, safety is first and foremost on everybody's mind, on everybody in this industry. So, you know, there's nobody out there who is uh, belittling safety ever. Although you have to. No, not at all. But did, I, my, my question, did you believe in the very beginning when you first were approaching even the, the shoot? I mean, how did that even start on the radar and was that also more important to passengers than than to pilots well that started the parachute started from uh, 1985 it was a uh, spring day late april Um, my brother was training for his ifr rating late in the afternoon on a beautiful April day. And why this is important is because uh, we we flew out of an airport that was a north and south runway. He took off to the north, a vagabond, an old 1946 vagabond, flying straight west across the departure end of the runway. So he's going straight into a low sun, on, you know, on a perfect day, probably looking down, but probably can't look forward. It's an old airplane and you know what happens to windscreens over 40 years of flying. Uh, they collected each other just off the end of the runway at about 500 feet. So Alan is in my dad's 182 RG. Uh, the, uh, the 182, Alan's airplane takes the struts out of the vagabond and folds that wing. So the airplane goes straight in. He lost four feet of the wing on the 182. It just cut it off like a knife. But he was able to get the airplane down on the ground. And he landed at 140 knots with full aileron in as it was rolling. So he landed at absolute minimum airspeed to get that thing onto the ground. He got out of the airplane and instead of saying, this is crazy, people shouldn't fly, Alan got out of the airplane and said, there has to be another way. There's got to be something different. People make mistakes. Accidents happen. It it shouldn't be life or death when there's a mistake. There's got to be something else. So that right there from that moment on started the search for the parachute. Hmm. And... I, I shouldn't say for the parachute, for the I quit button or some way out. And of course that brought us to uh, BRS in St. Paul and the group there and started learning about what they're doing. And they, uh, when we got together with them had actually just certified a parachute for a 150. So they've got a parachute that'll handle an airplane like a 150. We are developing the SR, 20 at the time, and our first gross weight at that time was 2,800 pounds, 160 knots. So a lot more than a 150. Mm. But of course, we looked at it and said, wow, you know, so it's got to be a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, you know, no big deal. Well, the other thing that we learned about parachutes when we were going through it is there is no, uh, at least in the early 90s, there was very little uh, data that you could get on parachutes, particularly for a parachute that needs to cover a wide range, uh, a, a huge spectrum. You know, we had parachutes that could do a lot of things. <clears throat> I mean, you could, the stuff coming out of the back of the airplane, you know, they're dropping tanks. The Apollos came down underneath a parachute. Parachutes can do a lot of things. 
except when they push a tank out of an, an airplane, they know exactly what that tank weighs every single time. And they know exactly how fast it's going when it pushes up. There are very, very few variables. Now we come along and say, we got an airplane that goes between 60 knots and 160 knots. It might be at 1,700 pounds, might be at 2,800 pounds, might be flying straight or level, might be in a spin. The parachute has to open fast when you're going slow because you're going to be slow down low. It's got to not open so fast when you're going fast that it tears itself apart. So all of these dynamics and how do you get it out of the, the airplane and clear the tail and all of these things are, you know, you can't pick up a physics book and say, well, let's just cross all these lines and there's our perfect parachute. So it was a tremendous amount of trial and error. Mm. But the parachute's in there because Alan was in a scenario where he'd have pulled the parachute. Right. And he was steadfast that every airplane we build is going to have an, a parachute on it. So when we're developing this, there were a number of times when, I mean, we, we bombed the desert many times. And what I mean by that is we filled 55 gallon drums full of sand, strapped them onto a pallet to create the weight that we needed, rented a C-123, took off and pushed these things out the back of the C-123 with a parachute on it, trying to develop a parachute that would meet these parameters. And we bombed the desert 38 times before we had one hold together. Wow. Time, you just learn more and more and more as you, you go through. And then you figure out, okay, it, it works at 160 knots. Now let's do it slow. And then, you know, it doesn't open and it's streamers in because it's not. And then you get it to work there and then you go back to a high speed and it tears it apart. And it's just back and forth and expanding that envelope on both sides until you can get something that actually works. So through that, I mean, there were a lot of days that we come back and go, I'm not sure that we're ever going to figure this out. You know, maybe we should do the airplane without a parachute. And Alan was pretty steadfast. No parachute, no airplane. Go figure it out. <laughs> you know, and, and we, we did. Uh, you know, so the, the other thing when I can look back at Cirrus and the timing of all of the, you know, the everything came together at the right time for us to be successful. Part of that timing were the people that we had with us. I mean, you hear me say lots of times, you know, Alan and I, you know, we did these things. Well, the we isn't Alan and I. The we is the team that we had together. You know, our, our current president of uh, innovation and operations, he started as an intern when he was in college in 88, back in Verbal, Wisconsin for us. He's now running all the operations here. You know, our, our very first employee is still with us. And, and it's the people that aviation, and I, I do put a lot of it on just plain aviation, attracts such great people that the team that we are able to put together is what has made Cirrus what it is today. You know, it's, it's the timing, it's the people, you know, it's the, the drive and determination, but you know, it's the crew that put that together that, you know, and it wasn't Alan and I standing in the desert trying to figure out why that parachute tore apart. Right. <laughs> we, had, we had people that actually figured it out. It's, it's just, it's, you know, it's amazing to me. Obviously I've been in the industry for decades and, and, it, and it's, it's, you see people come and go, you see companies try and fail and, and yet you, you push through so many challenges with those people, as you mentioned, getting through things. I mean, it, obviously it's not just even the innovations and the testing that you mentioned, it's the certification, like to the things that you've yeah. tackled and pushed through. And it seems like it's, it's literally that forcing, forcing them into reality. It, it, there was, there was a lot of times that it was force and grit, but there was also so many stories of the people that helped, you know, our, back to our VK 30. And I talked about Tom Hamilton and uh, how helpful he was and has been over the years, you know, but our 
PK-30 had 11 feet of drive system in it. So propellers 11 feet behind the engine. Wow. And on a couple of kids, when you start these things, it's like, okay, well, how do we make this work? Well, everything runs on drive shafts. That's not a big deal, right? Trucks, boats, you know, everything's got a drive shaft. You know, drive shaft should be easy. What we thought was the hard part at the time was how do we make the prop work 11 feet back? You know, and I had to figure that out. Literally just took the engine apart and said, okay, here's exactly how it works. The slip ring works. And we're going to do that on the tail. We built, built a little stub housing back there in a teeny little shaft, put a slip ring on it. So we copied the front of an engine. We just had 10 feet of tubing between the governor and now the slip ring. Right? Well, a lot's going on in a piston engine spinning a prop through a drive shaft and then so we keep breaking things and I was like what's happening here you know I was like torsional resonance and of course that's so like what the hell's torsional resonance never heard of torsional resonance you know and that's where each engine fire is a pulse into the drive shaft and the longer the shaft the more it twists and from each pulse it's twisting as it rebounds at the other end, you hit a point at which it resonates and it will break. Yeah, like some standing wave. All the time. <laughs> and as through that, I was like, well, who's made a drive shaft work in an airplane? You know, there's this guy named Moult Taylor. Let's call him. He picks up the phone, absolutely he'll help. Here's what you need. <laughs> and he worked with, he designed the clutch to handle a 300 horsepower engine and 11 feet of drive system and yeah, we couldn't have done that you know it's it's the people coming to us as we ask ask for help on stuff and that you know how do you make a drive shaft work in an airplane ah it's easy put a big long shaft on it <laughs> no nah, it's not that easy <laughs> oh my god well then I mean, you, you man, managed to make it all happen. And, and you, you know, Cirrus has begun to darken the skies. And then the next big thing comes along that everyone thinks is going to be, you know, the watershed moment of the VLJs. And everybody thinks they're going to be in the VLJ business and darken the skies, uh, except, for, uh, except for maybe yep. a few folks saying that's not going to happen. Yeah. And, and yet at the end of this whole you know, race to nowhere, it seems, toward, towards the end. There you are with the vision jet, you know, can, you're building steam and showing up, all, uh, you know, fast, getting faster and faster like a locomotive after, you know, towards the end. And you're, you're basically the winner. Like, how does that happen? You know, the vision jet... Uh... I was in every meeting as we were talking about what that airplane will be, you know, from the beginning on. And when I flew it for the first time, I got out and said, holy smokes, it's better than I ever imagined. <laughs> that is the one product that is better than I imagined it would be. It is, but it, it's, it's the same, same formula as the SR. You know, make sure everybody in the airplane is comfortable, make it intuitive, make it very easy to fly. So those were the keys when we were putting it together. When you look at, at jets and the VLJs at the time, and I would say uh, probably the, well, the most successful would be the Eclipse. And then of course we were up against the Diamond Jet at the time and Piper Jet was playing around with that, you know, those, those airplanes. All of those airplanes had a vision of, we all want to fly around in uh, Gulfstream 550s. Mm -hmm. Except we can't afford a Gulfstream. We can only afford this teeny little airplane. Right, make a mini so, version of it. Yeah, let's not make a mini version of it. The reason the Gulfstream is shaped the way it is is because it's a $55 million airplane. <laughs> Don't try to make a teeny little Gulfstream. And I use the analogy of uh, a limousine. If you like driving around in a limousine, but you can only afford a Ford Hugo, you don't create the Ford Hugo to look like a teeny little limo. <laughs> <Get> the, <laughs> right? 
so we were after what makes sense for personal flying and it's just going to happen to have a jet engine on it we're not out to build a teeny little business yet we're out to build the jet that we want to fly in. and simple things like you know well when we started it it was going to be a million dollar airplane today as we sit we're up in the upper twos for the airplane a two million dollar airplane is probably not being bought by a 28 year old kid these are personal airplanes for the pilot owner in the front left seat well if you're flying around in your own two and a half million dollar airplane you're probably getting more like you and i some gray hair we move a little bit slower i got a few more pounds than i should when you try to get into the front seat of so many of these corporate style airplanes it's brutal right the work in the house is the front left seat because those airplanes are designed for that 25 year old employee sitting in the front the owner's in the back in the king's chair right okay we want the king's chair to be start with that very very comfortable up front it's got to be really easy because we are not professional pilots we're flying the airplane for business with our friends or our family in it you know we think of other things oh and by the way it's got to be really easy to get in and out of so the door is right here you know and i think about sticking your family in some of these other airplanes you know you got a eight-year-old or five-year-old kid what does a five-year-old kid want to do tug on every lever and pull every push every button and, well if you're eight feet away from the door are important and you keep telling yourself, don't touch the door, don't touch the door. I sure like being next to it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's simple things like that. You know, the doors in a pressurized airplane, doors are rather important. You know, you're right next to it. Very easy to get into, into and out of, you know, the seating arrangement. We wanted a five seat airplane, but to be wide enough to sit comfortably, it'd be too wide, it would be too heavy. So that's when we offset that middle seat in the back. So three people are incredibly comfortable in this. And it actually ended up with enough space when we're all said and done that we call it a five plus two. You've got the two jump seats all the way in the back. Mm. But it's just, it, it's so flexible. You know, because of Thanksgiving, I'm running down tomorrow to pick up my son down in uh, Hutchinson, Kansas, and I'm bringing him a dresser. Well, I already got the dresser in the back of the airplane. You know, the seats pop right out, pop dresser in i mean it's just it is an amazing airplane and incredibly easy to fly it is it, it's a wonderful way to travel yeah and, and you tackled again so many first i mean not only with like the the parachute and everything else but it's a single engine jet you were the only one out of all of those to say well we're going to go simple. We're going to go single engine. I mean, what does that do to operating costs when you look at the any, anything like that? It's it's remarkable difference. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. As we were going through the you know the math in the beginning, it's like you know, it's, does one engine cost less than two? Yeah. All right, we want one. You know, it has to be that. You know. Well, it, and, and you know, certainly. From my world and in, in, you know the maintenance world and design and things like that, you look at it and and anytime anyone says anything about putting a second engine on anything, it's obviously not double, it's triple because you need the systems to make them all fit together as well. Yep. Yeah. No. And and right this this airplane it it uh, it blows me away. I I now obviously I'm flying around in a vision jet and man I'm pinching myself every day I get into it and fly it. It's a wow. fantastic airplane. And I do get to fly the SRs quite a bit still, too. And I, I flew a brand new SR not long ago, and I got out of that. And I was like, holy smokes, is this a nice airplane? I mean, it's where these airplanes have come, it, it is amazing. And again, it's the people that, you know, it's all the designers that are working out the last details now, the dedication of the staff that, that builds these. And, Lord knows anybody who's running a business this year, they, you know, you need dedicated people there. Oh. It's, been, uh, it's been challenging on a number of fronts. Yeah, I can only imagine. So 
I mean, obviously, uh, at, at this point, um, uh, you're involved on an advisory basis uh, to Cirrus Aircraft, um, uh, but but I, I can't imagine uh, that uh, you know ev everyone in the entire facility doesn't perk up to everything that you say when you go there. What what do you see from your perspective in your seat as to you know where where things are going? You've you're making it through very strongly uh, through a very difficult time, as you mentioned with COVID, and it um, and they have the future. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been uh, an emotional time stepping away from a company that started 36 years ago. Uh, you know, not stepping away totally, but uh, you get to the point where it becomes uh, a company that needs more than probably what I could give it at the time and needs to change more in a way that maybe the me as one of the founders would have been difficult to take some of those steps with where the company really needs to go. So uh, I, I thought it was time and you know, I still have my help and I have an airplane to go fly around. And what I love the most is meeting the, with the customers and getting together with the people. And, uh, I thought it was a good time to let somebody else take some of the headaches. And I got to tell you in March and April, I was sitting there going, man, Glad somebody else. Take it. <laughs> I think the team that is there has done a fantastic job. I yeah. mean, they've gotten through this. Uh, it, the other part is that you know people still want airplanes, and and sales have still been strong through this. And and you kind of sit back and say, yeah, it kind of makes sense. If you can fly, or you need to fly a lot, now's the time that you want to fly yourself, not be sitting in the right. back of a big tube. You know, going through major airports, you want to go when you want to go. I mean, all of the reasons aviation makes sense, it really makes sense this year. Right. So that aspect, you know, people still want airplanes. The difficulty comes in running the company through that. You know, every supplier is going through the same thing we are. You know, you got to be careful with COVID. How do you make sure that your staff doesn't end up getting sick and with shutdowns and, you know, the, the, the supply chain has been difficult for us as I know it has been for every company around the world this year. It, it's a tough thing to manage. And the team at Cirrus is, well, I'd put them up against any group of people anywhere in the world. I, I think they're the best and they're proving this year to be the best. I think they're doing a job, absolutely a fantastic job. Now, yeah. you know, I, I know we've got a lot of customers on the, the line here at, I'm sure some of them are going, yeah, right. you know, where's my parts? You know? <laughs> it, and all I can say is it has been a tough year, you know, and supply yeah. chain has been a problem. And there are things that, you know, I can sit here and say, we are doing a fantastic job. We could still do better. We all know that there are a lot of areas that we have to work on uh, to keep making the company better. But everything is moving in the right direction. The new CEO is doing it. He kept the team together and the people that are there underneath them are the ones that actually created these airplanes. They were there figuring out how to put a parachute on a jet and you know how do you really make a single engine jet operate and how do you make it simple and, and intuitive. Right. Well, you know, it really is an amazing success story, uh, no, no matter what. I mean, it, these are tough times for everybody, and um, and, and Cirrus is is shining uh, uh, during all of it, and and it's all it's it's all relative these days. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's all about where we come out of this, um, because the the hope is that that this is one succinct period of time that we can look back on as a, a tragic time, but 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 grow yeah. way beyond and be a memory that we look back on uh, during this. So Dale, I want to thank you again so, so much for joining us here on Social Flight Live and most of all for everything that you have done during your career for general aviation and, and that you continue to do and that includes taking time out of your day to join us on the show. I really do appreciate that. Well, Jeff, thank you. I enjoyed this. I, I love, like I said, I love meeting with the customers and even when somebody's upset, that's okay. I can. <laughs> I still want to meet you. 
And all I can say is we can do better and we're trying. Everybody at Cirrus wants to take care of the customers. They want Cirrus to be the best. So we'll get, the, we'll get there. That is the best Thanks. and healthiest attitude that you ever could have, of course. Yeah. Well, thank you. This was fun. I enjoyed it. You're very, very welcome. So to everyone else out there, thank you so, so much for taking time out of your evening and joining us here on Social Flight Live. And again, we have great shows coming up. In addition to tonight, we have more coming up. Paul Bertarelli from Avway will be joining us on December 1st, next Tuesday. Mike Bush will be back on December 8th. Kevin Lacey from Airplane Repo will be joining us on December 15th, and we cap off uh, the uh, towards the end of the month during the, the Christmas week with NORAD will be coming and joining us. North American Aerospace Defense Command will have someone joining us. Of course, they do the Santa Tracker, among other things. But again, um, uh, we're here to support you. Please check out socialflight.com, download the free app, and uh, of course, be sure to try to get in on that last uh, chance for this uh, uh, period's prize that we're giving away. Again, Dale, thank you so, so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it and everything that you do for general aviation. Until next time, I'm Jeff Simon for Social Flight. Blue skies.